Hello everyone, and welcome to Introduction to R Part 13, Exploring and Preparing Data. So in this episode, we're going to finally jump in and start working with real data and learning how to do some data manipulation tasks and thinking about the sorts of questions you want to be asking when you first look at a data set and the sorts of operations that you'll need to be doing to prepare the data for analysis and predictive modeling. So to this end, we're going to be working with the Titanic disaster data set on Kaggle. So we're just going to load that in and go through and look at the data and do various pre-processing steps that you might want to do before conducting any kind of other analysis. The important part is just giving you a sense of the types of things you want to be thinking about when you're first loading in a data set and preparing it for analysis. So to start off with, we're going to load in the Titanic training data. We're going to use the read.csv function we learned about to do that, and it's contained in this input slash train folder. So that loaded in the data into our environment. We'll first start by checking the structure of the data. We learned how to do this in the lesson on data frames. So we can see here that the training data has 891 observations or rows, also sometimes called records, and it has 12 variables. So after looking at the structure of the data frame, it's often good to run the summary function as well. So we'll do that and see what the range of the values is. As you might expect, passenger ID is just essentially a counter that counts from one to the number of passengers. Survived is a binary variable, it looks like, either one or zero. Um, zero, I suppose, indicates that they did not survive, and one would generally indicate true, which are people that did survive. Looks like P class is, it's, it's stored as a numeric variable, it seems, but it's actually only has, it seems to only have three unique values, so that's something we may need to address later. Name is a unique identifier. Sex has two categories in this data set. Um, age, we see something interesting here with age actually. We're seeing the spread of age, but there's also 177 NA values for age. So that's something that we'll probably need to address in our pre-processing. So after loading data and looking at some general summaries, it's good to ask yourself a few questions in the pre-processing step before you use the data for analysis. And I've noted some of those key questions here. So one good question to ask is, do you need all the variables? Sometimes a data set will have perhaps repeated variables or variables that don't tell you anything useful. And those can often be removed, which reduces the size of the data set. And in some cases that can result in significant gains in both memory and processing time for running uh, algorithms downstream. You should also be thinking about, do you need to transform any of the variables? Sometimes data is loaded in in the wrong format, or you want to put it on a different scale or things like this. So you should be thinking about if any of the variables could stand to be transformed into a form that is more usable. You should also be cognizant of whether there are any missing or NA values, outlier values, or other strange quirks in the data that might have a negative impact on whatever analyses or predictive modeling you're doing. And you should also be thinking about whether you should be creating new variables. Oftentimes you can create new variables from existing ones, such as say concatenating two things together, multiplying things together. There are many different ways you could potentially combine variables. Um, doing that is sometimes what's known as feature engineering. You're essentially creating new variables or new features from existing ones that can provide more insight than the single columns can alone. So that is also something you generally want to be thinking about. Determining whether you need certain variables or not depends largely upon the task that you're using the data for, but 
In many cases, a data set will contain some identifier row that isn't going to be useful for prediction purposes. So if you're using a data set for predictive modeling, you'll often want to remove that row. In this case, the Titanic data provided this passenger ID column, which is nothing more than a numbered list of indices for each passenger. And that's not something that is useful for prediction. So in this case, we're going to remove that by selecting the column and setting it to null. Now we know the survived variable indicates whether passengers lived or died. That's definitely something that we need to keep if we're using this for prediction, because that's our prediction target. So we should keep that. The variables for passenger class, sex, age, siblings, and fare, all could potentially be useful for prediction. And they didn't have too much wrong with them when we checked the summary data. So we'll keep all of those. So we have three other variables to consider, name, ticket, and cabin. First, let's look at name. We can see here that by printing out the names in sorted order, the first 15, but there are 891 levels in the name column, and that's the same number as there are rows in the whole data set. So essentially every row is a person with a unique name, and that means that this name column is not likely to be useful for prediction because everybody has a different name so it's not telling us anything of commonality between passengers next let's look at the ticket variable we'll look at the top 25 of that um it looks like the ticket variable is actually encoded as a factor and it has 681 levels so that's not quite as many as the total rows in the data set, but it's pretty close. There were 891 levels. So most of the ticket numbers here are unique. And just from looking at this, it doesn't appear that there is any particular pattern or rhyme or reason for what these numbers mean. So this is another variable that would probably be hard to extract a lot of value from in prediction, especially without knowing more about why these numbers are what they are. So this is probably something else we should remove. And finally, let's look at the cabin variable. Now, cabin only has 148 levels. I say only because it's fewer than last ones. That's still way more than we would probably want for prediction, especially with as few total records as we have. Like the data set has fewer than a thousand records, so we don't want to predict on with too many different variables. And essentially, every single level of a categorical variable is can be thought of as an additional predictor or an additional column in a sense. So this is still a lot, but there is actually some degree of commonality between the values in here we can see that a lot of these cabins are prefixed with a letter and those overlap so like a10 a14 a16 so maybe there are different sections of the ship that are these letters and if we group those into their own categories we'd probably be wet left with much fewer categories than 148 and that might be something that's actually Going to be useful for a prediction that we can use so let's keep the cabin variable for now when we loaded in this data we did not include strings as factors equals false so all of the character data was loaded in as factors like when we inspected the sex cabin embarked and ticket columns they all were categorical factors and that's not necessarily what we wanted so let's turn in particular, the name variable, let's turn that back into a character using as.character because a factor with levels that is the same number as the whole data set isn't really useful. Let's turn that back into a character so we can look at it later. And another good thing to do when you're doing a prediction task is just to inspect the target you're predicting on. In this case, that's survived. So let's just use the table function to make a table of counts for that variable and see what it looks like. We can see that 549 people 
or zero, which means false, they did not survive, and 348 people did survive. So on the whole, more people in the data set did not survive than survived. Now, zeros and ones are not the nicest way to look at this. It would be easier to read and more meaningful if we actually had words here that said, say, survived and not survived or something like that. So we can do that using what we've learned in the factor lesson. So let's do that. So we'll have we'll create a new variable that's a factor of the survived variable, but we'll assign it new levels, died and survived. So if we run this new table, it'll show us explicitly what these two columns mean instead of just having zeros and ones there, which is a little bit harder to interpret. Similarly, the P class variable was actually stored as a numeric we saw earlier, but there's only three unique values for it, class one, two, and three. Three is like lower class, two is middle class, and one is upper class. So that is actually probably better stored as a categorical variable. And in this case, it's an ordered categorical variable because there is a sense of scale to it or ordering because lower class is below middle class and middle class is below upper class. So we can restore this variable as an ordered factor using this ordered function that we learned about before. So we'll resave P class. We'll store it as ordered P class and we'll give it new levels three, two, and one. And we'll just look at the distribution of the classes with table function. So as you can see, most of the passengers were in third class. Um, interestingly, there were fewer passengers in class two than there were in class one. So there were quite a few passengers that were in the first class and a similar number in second class. And then the majority were in third class. So now we're going to revisit the cabin variable. And what we're going to do is strip off the numeric component and keep the character prefix that seemed to indicate perhaps the section of the ship where the room was. And that should help us reduce the number of categories significantly. So to do that, we're going to start by converting the factor back into a character. Then we're going to use this if else function that we learned about a few lessons ago to do this operation for us. So we're going to say if the cabin is equal to the empty string, so if it's missing, we're just going to keep it because we don't really know what to do with that. So we'll keep it as is. And if it's not missing, we're going to use this substring function to strip off essentially the first character of the cabin because we know the first character is that single letter value and that's what we want so then we'll convert that back into a factor and we'll just look at the table of the result let's run this you can see that in the new cabin variable there are actually many passengers with missing cabins so that's interesting it could be that maybe passengers that didn't survive weren't there to tell the tale so they couldn't maybe figure out what cabin they were in who knows but most of the people actually had a missing cabin or the empty string, but you can see that we did categorize everyone else in these general, what perhaps are sections of the ship, A, B, C, D, etc. Another important thing to consider when looking at data for the first time is to check whether there are missing or NA values, outliers, or just other strange values that don't conform to the normal format of the other data. NA values are very common, so that's something that we should learn how to check for. So to do that, we're going to just create a dummy vector here with some NAs in it. We're creating a new vector, it has two NA values. And to check where NA values occur within a vector, you use this function, is.na. So if we run is.na on the dummy vector, this will return a logical vector, which says true or false, for each of these values in the vector. So the first four values are false because those aren't NA. 
but this fifth one is, so that will be a true, and these two are false, but the last one is also true. So let's run that, and we should see a true-false vector with two trues in it. So there it is. And after detecting variables using this is.na, you can do something with the NAs, such as fill them with a value or other things like that. So as we saw earlier, the summary function will also detect NA values. So if we run that on the age column, which we already know has some NA values in it, we can see again how many NAs it has, 177. And when you have NA values, you have to consider what you're going to do with them. There are many different things you could do. Um, some of the common things you might think about is you could replace the NA values with some other number, such as zero, or perhaps some negative number to distinguish them from the other values. You could replace them with some common or central value, such as the mean or median. That could be a reasonable thing to do, depending on what the variable is. You could try to impute those values with some other method, which means filling them in using, say, a predictive method instead of something simple like the mean or median. Um, one example of that would be a nearest neighbors method, where you would take a record that has a missing value and find other records that are the most similar to it in some sense that don't have missing values, and then you'd use those similar records to fill in the missing value for the one that you don't know. And another thing you could consider doing is simply dropping rows that have any values or splitting data into multiple parts, one where the NA values exist and one where they don't. So there's many different things you could do. Um, I generally wouldn't recommend dropping all the rows that have NA values unless there aren't very many of them because a data set can have lots of NA values sometimes and you don't want to be throwing away huge portions of your whole data set. So maybe if you only have a couple rows, that's fine, but we don't want to be throwing out 177 rows because that's like 20% of our whole data set and losing that much data will not be good for our predictions. So we want to figure out something reasonable to do with those so that we can keep them. So to figure out what to do with the age variable, we're going to start by just exploring the distribution of it by making a histogram. So to make a histogram, you just run this hist function on whatever variable you want. You pass in the number of bins or breaks you want. We'll run that. And we can just see a basic histogram here. Uh, you now it just so happens that the median age for this data set is 28. So let's show how we would go about filling in 28 for all of the missing values in the age column. So that is what this block is going to do. First, we're going to create a logical vector identifying all the positions where the age variable is NA. So that's what this is doing. We're finding is NA of the age variable, and we're just storing that in a logical. Then again, we're going to use our if else function to do this for us. So we're going to make this new age variable by running if else on that logical that we made. So if that is true, meaning if it's if the age is empty or NA, we're going to fill in a value 28, which is the median. And if it's not true, we'll just revert back and store the actual age that we know the value for. And then we'll go and we'll resave that new variable as the age in our training set. And we'll just check the summary again to confirm that there are no NA values left that we've successfully filled them in. And let's just recheck the histogram as a sanity check. And we'd expect to see a bin covering the age of 28 to be much taller now because we just added over 100 new entries into that column. Let's just confirm that that happened. So we can see here that the bin that covers the age 28 has gotten much taller than it used to be. Now, of course, some of the ages that we set are probably way off. Like some of the people we assigned as 28 might have been kids. Some of them might have been quite a bit older. But since we didn't know what they were, just putting them in a middling value seems like a at least reasonable thing to do that means we don't have to throw all those rows away. 
So next we're going to investigate the fare variable, which is how much passengers paid. So to do that, we're going to use this box plot function. And I'll run that. So the box plot shows you is the median and the interquartile range of the data as well as outliers. So the median is the middle 50th percentile, which is this black bar here. And the interquartile range are the values between the 25th and 75th percentile, and those are contained within this box. But we can see that the box plot is actually squashed very small because there's these points that are way, way higher than normal, like these outlier points. There's at least one person here that paid, it seems, over $500 for their ticket, which is much, much more than what the median is, which it looks like the median is maybe only like $40 or something like that. It's hard to tell because it's so squashed down by how far away this outlier is. But outliers this extreme are things we should think about dealing with because a predictive model we make might be drastically affected by an outlier this large, and these are not typical values. So we might want to think about removing the rows associated with this outlier or doing something else with it so that it's not going to unduly affect our models. So for interest, let's identify who this passenger is. To do that, we can use the which.max function, which identifies the index of whatever is the maximum value for a vector. So that's what we're going to do here. We're going to store the index of this high roller using which.max. And we're saying which.max on the fare column. We'll print out the index here, and then we'll use the index to get the row of that person and just see who it is and print it to the screen. So it was index position 259, and the person apparently was Miss Anna Ward, who paid $512 or so for the ticket. It appears she did survive as well, so maybe paying a huge amount for your ticket meant that you were bound to survive and they would let you on one of the lifeboats. So finally, we're going to consider whether we should create any new variables. Now, new variables can be made in any number of ways from existing variables. Like, one way is to simply add, subtract, multiply, divide existing numerical variables together. And oftentimes doing something like that will have a reasonable conceptual purpose as well. For example, we could make a new variable indicating how many total family members a passenger had on board. We saw earlier that the sibsep variable is how many siblings or spouses the person had on board, and the parc variable indicated parents on board. So if we were to take those two and add them together, we could create a new variable that is indicative of the total number of family members, close family members, the person had on board. So let's do that and store that new variable as family. And why don't we actually check who had the most family members on board? That might be an interesting thing to try. So to do that, we can use this which construction, which checks the index where a logical statement is true. So we're checking where the indices exist, where this new family variable we made is equal to the max of the family variable. And we'll just take that, those indices, and use them to index into train to extract those people. So we'll run that. And it looks like there are seven people included here that all seem to be related to one another. So they all have the last name Sage, and all of their ages are set to 28, we can see. So it seems that all of these people are people for whom we probably didn't actually know the age, and we filled them in with 28. Um, they all paid the same fare. They embarked from the same place. They have 10 family members on board. So it looks like a large family of siblings and perhaps some parents and spouses were all on board, and tragically, it appears that all seven of these family members have zero marked for survived, so all of these people perished, and that could provide actually useful data for making predictions, because 
there could be other family members in this group that are in the test data set that we're supposed to make predictions on for this competition. So in this case, we'd probably predict that any other member of this family group probably did not survive because we know that all of the other ones that we know about perished. So in this lesson, I wanted to show some of the higher level considerations that you should be thinking about when you're looking at data for the first time. But we also do need to learn about how to actually do nitty gritty data cleaning tasks. So in the next three lessons, we're going to learn about how to deal with data of different types and do data pre-processing and cleaning of those data types. So in the next lesson, we're going to learn about cleaning character data, and then we'll learn about dealing with numeric data. And in the lesson after that, we'll learn about dealing with dates. So see you then.